This episode is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Okay, everyone, summer's coming, so it's time to get your summer reading list together. But there are going to be times when you're too tired to hold a book or some electronic device. Sometimes you want to just lie there and let someone else do all the work. And that means a podcast. And I recommend that that podcast be a top-shelf podcast named Best of Apple in 2018. One that brings on fascinating people, athletes, authors, and scientists, to mobsters and spies. I'm talking about, of course, the Jordan Harbinger Show. Either entertain me or inform me. And that's what Jordan does with each and every episode. Let me recommend two specific episodes to you. I suggest listening to episode 655, David Eagleman, How Our Brains Construct Reality, and episode 662, Daniel J. Levetin, How to Think Critically in the Post-Truth Era. You can't go wrong with adding the Jordan Harbinger show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting. There's never a dull show. Search for the Jordan Harbinger show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to Pax Britannica, the Scottish Revolution interview series, Scottish Royalism during the British Civil Wars, with Dr. Andrew Lind. Welcome to the Pax Britannica Scottish Revolution interview series. In this episode, I'm excited to speak with Dr. Andrew Lind, early career researcher at the University of Glasgow. Dr. Lind completed a thesis titled Bad and Evil Patriots? Scottish Royalism during the British Civil Wars, 1638-1651. to Dr. Lind has contributed chapters to The National Covenant in Scotland, 1638-1689, to published with Boydell and Brewer. Listeners of Pax Britannica can purchase this collection at a 40% discount by going to Boyd and Brewer's website and entering the code BB870. This discount applies to both the physical and digital copies. He's also published an article on Glasgow during the Civil Wars, which is available online for free. Information and links for all of these can be found in the show notes and on the website. Dr. Lind, thank you so much for joining me today. A pleasure to be here. Just before we get into things, could you briefly summarise the historiography of your field and where you see yourself within it? It's a massive question. Um, <laughs> so, obviously, the, the, the British Civil Wars is a massive field, and there's there's so much that's been written and researched on, on the British Civil Wars as a whole and as the, on the conflicts in each of the three kingdoms and, of course, Wales. It, so it is, it's a huge field and there's a massive breadth of the kind of stuff that everyone's been doing. But in Scotland, the historiography seems to be playing catch up a little bit, especially with the, the scholarship on the Civil Wars itself. And really, over it's really only been in the last kind of 50 years since the 1970s that we are now starting to see really... Uh, a real change in how people are researching this period of time. And before that, the historiography was really still dominated by a lot of hagiographical and Whiggish narratives, which were produced in the uh, 18th and 19th centuries. And they had a really long legacy within the scholarship of the civil wars. But since the 1970s, and especially since the work of people like uh, David Stevenson, who is really like the godfather of historical research on this period in Scotland, and also the work of people like Al McInnes and, and John Young, and then more recently, people like Chris Langley, Laura Stewart, Mickey Brock, Jamie McDougall, Carrie Schultz, you know, Sal Cipriano, all these like, amazing scholars who are really starting to come through now. We're seeing a massive expansion on, on the scholarship in the Civil Wars. And that's produced a lot of quite radical revisionisms of how we should interpret this period, especially how we should interpret the Covenanters and the Covenanting regime. And a big hallmark of the more recent scholarship has been to really break down Covenanting consensus and try and get to the heart of how did Covenanters see the, the Civil Wars as they were evolving and, and how did they see what they were doing in their part 
part in the civil wars and that has produced a lot of really interesting scholarship about the different kind of shades of covenanting and the conflicting covenanting identities which are created from the moment that the national covenant is penned in, in 1638 and which continue to evolve in reaction to the events which are transpiring both in Scotland and throughout British Isles. So my kind of angle in this was that 99% of all the scholarship in Scotland on, on the civil wars in Scotland are, is focused on on covenanters which is strange because you do need two sides to tango right you do need another side in the civil war and there hasn't been a huge amount done on on scottish royalists which was kind of the reason that it, it piqued my interest there really is only a handful of studies which have tried to engage with scottish royalism first and foremost amongst them is barry robertson's book uh, royalists at war which looks at the royalist war effort in scotland and ireland and that's largely because that absence of research on scottish royalism is largely due to the fact that it's been somewhat replaced by studies on leading royalists and of course I'm talking about James Graham the Marquis of Montrose and so there, there's quite a lot of studies on, on Montrose himself and the so-called year of miracles which uh, Montrose leads the royalist army in Scotland to a number of victories over the course of 1644 and 1645. And so those kind of studies have been basically a proxy for studies on royalism. And so we've, we've gotten to the weird situation where we know quite a lot about leading royalists, people like Montrose and the work of people like John Scally on James Hamilton, the Marquis, and in future Duke of Hamilton is another good example of this. So we know a lot about the, the kind of the main figures in the royalist movement in Scotland, but we don't actually know a lot about royalism. Like how did people see royalism? What was royalist ideology in Scotland compared to elsewhere? How did people understand covenanting from that oppositional position? and how did they see themselves fitting into this conflict which was engulfing not only Britain but of course the Thirty Years' War is raging on the continent so how do they see all this within that context so that was the, the kind of the avenue that I was trying to carve out for myself and a niche that I would like to hide in within the, the scholarship where I fit in, in that I, people might have uh, different views uh, probably somewhere down the bottom in our obscure footnote um, <laughs> but yeah so that that was basically what I was trying to do with uh, with both my PhD research and and all the uh, the kind of the articles and stuff that's been born out of that. It's basically just trying to get to the root of what was royalism in Scotland? Who were these Scottish royalists? How did they see this conflict? And how did they justify their resistance both to themselves and to their opponents? So it's interesting that you bring up the focus on the covenant and cause and something that's quite apparent in older scholarship of the Wars of the Three Kingdoms, back then usually just called the English Civil War, and it's been, I've noticed it actively railed against in newer works, is the idea that Scotland and the Scots were synonymous with the Covenanters, that there was, they were one and the same, and the idea that the Bishop's Wars in particular were an Anglo-Scottish war in the old medieval style. I wonder if you could speak more about why that's necessarily not the case. Yeah, this is probably like a pet hate of mine as well. Uh, <laughs> and something that seems to only have gotten worse the more I've kind of dug into this. And you're absolutely right. There was a kind of association with covenanting as basically an expression of Scottish identity. And, and part of that, I think, can be explained by those hagiographical accounts, which I mentioned, and, and also the, the, the kind of Whiggish histories of the 18th, 19th and early 20th centuries, because they tended to portray covenanting as that expression of Scottish national identity. And it's been something that people have equated the National Covenant to things like the Declaration of Our Broth. And because of that, people tend to look at the period as this is a, almost a national awakening and a, and a, and a moment in time where Scotland Scottish national consciousness comes alive and is has this kind of moment of unity. The problem with that is that it's not true. Um, <laughs> and if you do look into it and you, you do look underneath the surface, you find that Scottish society across the kingdom is incredibly divided for the entirety of the British Civil Wars. And you know, one way I've done that is I've looked at things like borough records, looking in, in these um, these towns and cities where there's division at all levels of society, and looking at things like Kirk Session records, Presbytery records, Synod records, and and again, you can see that people are having these debates, these political debates across the kingdom, in the parishes, in the cities, in the towns. They're having discussions like, how can we wage war against the king who God has put on the throne? How can we justify that? They're talking about things like providence. They're talking about things like divine right, although they don't necessarily speak about it in those kind of terms. So the, the conflation of Scots with Covenanters is actually incredibly problematic. And it, we're quite lucky now that we're at a stage where it's quite rightfully been slapped down. And if, if anyone follows uh, myself or Professor Steve Murdoch on Twitter, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But we need to do that because it is, it's a myth and it's infected the scholarship and the historiography for far too long. And that is 
impacted how we have perceived the civil wars. And I hope that if I've had any contribution to the, the scholarship, it's to try and get people to look at this period again and, and particularly look at parish politics and what's happening on the ground because I think people would be generally surprised to see the level of division and the level of conflict which is happening in Scotland supposedly when it's experienced this period of uh, national unity. These local divisions, were they being papered over by the National Covenant, which in its initial signing phase did seem, at least on paper, to take the kingdom by storm, but that's not necessarily the case. Yeah, I mean, the National Covenant itself is a, is a very problematic document because it is a masterstroke in ambiguity. And this is something that, again, I don't think many people appreciate is that the divisions between royalists and covenanters in Scotland are not massive gulfs. It's nowhere near the kind of ideological gap which develops in England and in Ireland. There really is shades of grey between the covenanting and the royalist position. And that's why that, especially in 1638 and 1639, when the covenanting movement is really starting to establish itself, most royalists would agree with the, the religious sentiments of the National Covenant. The most royalists would consider themselves you know moderate calvinists and they they agree that the uh, negative confession of 1581 which is also known as the king's confession they they absolutely can get behind that they understand that and they support it their problem is is that they don't agree with a the need for it for a resubscription and b the constitutional reach of the actions of the covenanters so they vehemently oppose this idea that the covenanters have basically acted against royal authority because that is incredibly dangerous and it's incredibly destabilizing. And again, people are looking around to what's happening elsewhere in, in the British Isles and, and on the continent. And it, it's scary. You see regions collapse in anarchy and disarray because people are pulling at these strands of power and, and pulling at these concepts of what ordered society should look like and what people agree ordered society should look like. The covenant itself isn't necessarily, you know, the one document that divides the royalist and covenanting positions. It's more to do with the conflicting perceptions of what the both the covenanting movement is trying to do and what the royalists are doing in opposition. Because as soon as the, the National Covenant is signed, it creates this counter position where there are people throughout the, uh, the country and kingdom who uh, are very mistrusting of the, the covenanting regime and of what it's trying to achieve. So, I mean, the National Covenant is very popular in Scotland. And you can see that through the subscription campaigns, which receive thousands and thousands of subscriptions from people from all levels of society. But when the King's Covenant is produced in opposition to the National Covenant in the autumn of uh, 1638, it also receives thousands of signatories. Now, the King's Covenant is always seen in, in the historiography as this kind of failure that never gets off the ground. But actually, it's a failure because, and this is a, a trend for the entirety of the Civil Wars, that the Scottish Royalist leaders are terribly organized. They have terrible logistical skills, which hampers their efforts all the way through the, the civil wars. So it's a failure in logistics more than a failure in the sentiment of the document. Um, and so I think that the, the National Covenant is very much, it does paper over some of the, the cracks between the, both the covenanting position and the royalist position, but also within the covenanting position as well, because there are lots of moderate covenanters who sign the National Covenant and stay loyal to the regime for a long time, but they harbour very serious doubts about the direction of the regime, especially after 1641, after the Treaty of London, especially after 1643, after the signing of the Solemn League and Covenant. And then, of course, the big break happens in uh, 1647 and 1648 with the engagement crisis. So you've spoken a bit about the opposition to the Covenant from moderate Calvinists, but of course Calvinists weren't the only religious denomination in Scotland at the time. Can we see a, a fairly major portion of the Catholics and Episcopalian Scots backing the Royalist cause in this? So that's a really interesting question, and this is something that is another major theme within previous conceptions of Royalism in Scotland. So to kind of to provide the framework for the answer to that question, when people look at Royalism in Scotland in this the civil wars, they kind of look at what came before and they look at what came after. So they look in particular to the 1630s, they see the kind of the fruition of the policies which James VI has introduced post-1603 up until his death in 1625. And then of course, Charles I's ecclesiastical policies, which are all about, as you've already detailed in, in the podcast and your episodes, it's all about bringing uniformity to the churches of Scotland and England. And to do that, it's very much the adoption of a Anglican style episcopacy, although not Anglicanism mm. itself. And then people look 
what comes after the civil wars, they look at the restoration where Charles II's restoration regime vehemently imposes Episcopalianism upon Scotland and enforces it quite ruthlessly throughout Charles's reign. And then they also look a little bit further ahead to Jacobitism. And of course, one of the main hallmarks of Jacobitism is Episcopalianism. So people kind of look at the civil wars where there hasn't been as much work done and they kind of assume that Episcopalianism must be a big driving force behind Scottish royals. But what I've argued in, in my my research and, and what Barry Robertson also hinted at in his book is that there is a real lack of Episcopalian ideology and Episcopalian sentiment within the Scottish Royalist cause during the Civil Wars. And I think po possibly the, the starkest example of that is that after the Glasgow Assembly dissolves Episcopacy in Scotland in, in 1638, there is no major kind of backlash against that, which is calling for the reinstatement of Episcopacy. And to be to be honest, I think that Charles the first knows by the end of 1638 that Episcopacy in Scotland is gubbed, uh, to be <laughs> frank. And uh, I think you can see that in the negotiations which happen between Charles and covenanting early covenanting regime, really the, the tables, whereby Charles essentially abandons his ecclesiastical policy in autumn 1638 and the run up to the the Glasgow Assembly. And that in that he basically abandons his long-term project, which would have hopefully have seen uh, in his eyes the reinstatement of full episcopacy and in Scotland. So people kind of, they, they look at this situation and they assume that that's the case, which really isn't. And if you look at things like the the clergy, if you look at depositions, which the, the Covenanting regime obviously seizes control of the, the Scottish Kirk and deposes opponents, both political and religious within the Kirk. And there, when you look at the, the records of these ministers who are deposed within the, the Kirk, there's very few examples of ministers who, you know, are called before presbytery or synod courts and start railing about Episcopalianism. They very often they adopt a far more political position where they attack the Covenanters for their illegitimacy, for seizing power which rightfully belongs to the king, and for enacting things which they have no right to enact. Obviously that can be uh, couched with episcopacy because, and this is something that many royalists do talk about in various tracts and oaths and things like that, is that episcopacy is justified not because it's biblically the best or scripturally, sorry, the best way that you set up a church. It's justified because Charles and Parliament have both decreed that it is so. And that's the defence for for episcopacy. Now, there is exceptions to that. Probably the most prominent is John Maxwell, who's the, the former Bishop of Ross, who takes up residence in England during the Civil Wars and writes several tracts. One or two are, are very pro-episcopal. I would argue that he's a bit of an outlier and you shouldn't really look too much into him. One, because he's A, writing in England and writing for an Anglican English audience for the most part. And uh, B, he is a former bishop, so he is somewhat uh, tainted by previous associations. Whereas if you look at some of the other royalists that are writing, people like Drummond, people like uh, Archibald Napier, Montrose himself, there is there's really a, a, a stark lack of pro-Episcopalianism. Now, if you compare that to Catholicism, and this is a really interesting comparison, because there are several prominent Catholics within Scotland who do support Charles I. The, you know, the, the big ones that I'm thinking of are people like the Earl of Nithsdale and the, the Marquis of Douglas. Those are, you know, big magnates who are very quietly, but not so quietly at the same time, Catholic. And everyone really knows that they're Catholic. So how do you justify that in a, in a civil war, which is basically about establishing, uh, you know, a form of Protestantism? And, you know, people aren't talking about religious toleration or anything like that on either side of the defense. And uh, the way that Charles I and the Royalists do that is they basically don't talk about it. And that's how you get away with it. <laughs> you just keep it out of the, keep it out of the public eye. Charles is in active communication with uh, people like Nisdale and, and, and Douglas all the way through the civil wars. And he basically comes to the conclusion that, you know, he, or they come to the conclusion that Charles is fine with them. He doesn't care what the what version of God they worship, as long as they are loyal and as long as they don't cause problems for him. And that's the kind of real politique line that, that Charles takes. He doesn't ever declare that in public, but in the letters between Charles and these people, you could, you really get that sense. And and actually, there's a good example later on where um, Montrose writes a, a declaration in defence of the Royalist Army in Scotland in which he addresses some of the complaints which are levelled against the Royalist Army for having Catholics in its ranks, particularly uh, the Irish Brigade who are fighting under Alistair McCullough, most of whom are Catholic. And Montrose addresses this by saying that, one, the Covenanters are just as guilty as this because they've consorted with Catholics in Ireland, and particularly he, they, he aims at people like Major General Robert Munro, who's the commander of Covenant and Forces in Ireland. But Montrose basically defends these Catholics in his ranks by saying that they are first and foremost loyal subjects to his majesty. So it doesn't actually matter what 
god they, they are they're worshiping which is a really interesting and again real real politique kind of assessment of allegiance and loyalty in this period to what extent do personal opinions and and uh, attitudes towards the elites of scottish society come into whether someone found themselves on the covenant side or the royalist side or whether they they swap sides i'm thinking particularly of montrose who from what i understand did not get on with some of the other covenanting leadership <laughs> and uh, that may be an understatement and that <laughs> that certainly influenced his decision to then switch sides i wonder if you could speak a bit more about that yeah and, and again this is another big theme within uh, past scholarship on, on Scottish royalism and royalism in general, to be honest, because royalism has maintained this kind of sense of being a noble cause, right? So people tend to look at the Scottish royalist cause and, and, and basically view it as a movement of nobles. It doesn't really have much uh, representation out with the nobility. And to, you know, to the degree that, you know, this is a war effort that just run predominantly by nobles, they are correct, but that's the same for the Covenanters, it's the same for the Irish Confederates, and it's the same for the English parliamentarians. So there is obviously a massive noble faction within the Scottish Royalist cause, and and again, there's there's that kind of mix between ideology and pragmatism, which is, again, is present on all sides of the, the conflict, where people do switch sides because their, their neighbour, who they've had long-standing feuds with, has joined the same side as them, and they don't want to be in the same side as them, or, you know, vice versa. And that happens all the time. And, and yeah, Montrose is an interesting one because he is in active communication with with Charles I in 1640. And Montrose, obviously, in 1638, comes out as a very hardline covenanter and one of the most zealous of the early covenanters. But by 1640, he has fallen out quite spectacularly with the Earl of Argyll, who becomes Marquess of Argyll. And he, from 1640 onwards, he gradually f- finds himself migrating into the royalist camp. And then very quickly, actually, finds himself as one of the the kind of main heads of that camp, especially at the King's Court in Oxford later on. There is professional rivalries which do come into play here, especially when people are deciding which side to come down on. And some of these rivalries are very old. If you look at the situation which develops in the Highlands, you have big families like the McDonald's who... Uh, come out as very, very royalist. And at least some of that can be explained by the fact that they have a long-standing feud with Clan Campbell. And obviously that doesn't go anywhere after the civil wars end. So yeah, there is the there's lots of little little motivate or not so little motivations which also come into play here. It's not just pure hard political ideology. And I think that just goes to speak to the fact that people in the 17th century were just as complex. They were just as conniving, just as loyal and just as indecisive as as people are just now. I'm glad you bring up the Highlands and and the, the the clans essentially, because something that struck me reading Steve Murdoch's book on Alexander Leslie is Leslie's anger at his fellow Athelmen, those of them who didn't join his cause. I'm curious, was there much of a division within clans and within families along royalist covenant alliance, or did uh, kinship ties play a, a powerful role? Uh, yes and no. The, there is obviously kinship is incredibly important in this period, and you can quite clearly see in a, in a lot of examples kinship having a major influence on which side of the divide people will find themselves on. But it's not kind of hard and fast. There is exceptions, even like the Campbells. So after 1638, when the Marquis of Argyll really cements his position as the kind of leading figure within the covenanting regime, it's interesting that Charles I and many of the, the kind of royalist leaders in Scotland ta- target the, the Campbells of Glenorchy in a series of letters because they feel that they can maybe try and convince them to to come over to their side. Just because you have the name Campbell or you have the name McDonald doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be a royalist or um, or a covenanter. And, I, and again, another good example of this is in, in Glasgow where there is a royalist circle which develops on the Borough Council and it's led by a man named James Bell and another man named Colin Campbell. So uh, you shouldn't read too much into the fact about uh, whose surname you have. But kinship and, and personal relations are very important and they do come into play. And uh, another example of this is the the Mackenzies. Uh, the Earl of Seaforth obviously comes is a bit of a lukewarm covenanter throughout the civil wars, incredibly indecisive. And when he does decide, it normally backfires in his face. Uh, but when he does commit to the royalist cause towards the end of 1645, especially in 1646, where he's part of that kind of 
bedraggled northern campaign where the royalists are shuffling about outside Inverness. You actually see a spike in uh, Mackenzie's brought before things like uh, synod courts and, and presbytery courts, uh, which is quite interesting because obviously it suggests that there's a shift within that kinship group where it's now about supporting the king's cause rather than the covenanting cause. So, I mean, more needs to be done on this, but it is uh, an important motivator uh, within Scottish society. So once someone decided which side they were going to be on or, or changed their mind and found themselves on the royalist side, how did they go about actually showing this support? Now, obviously, it's, it's a war, so they did fight, but there were non-violent methods as well, weren't there? Yeah, absolutely. And then this is another thing that you, you've got to kind of keep in mind is that the civil wars in Scotland have periods of kind of pause almost in, in, in open conflict at least. So we obviously have conflict in 1639 and 1640 and in between 1640, 41 to 1644, there is no active conflict in Scotland, but obviously those political debates which have been uh, raging between 1638 and 1640 don't just disappear. Society doesn't just miraculously heal itself. So people are continuing to have these debates uh, throughout Scotland in that period. And obviously, when war breaks out again in 1644 and, and, and ravages Scotland between 1644 and 1646, not all of Scotland is an active war zone. So we have large swathes of, of the kingdom which don't experience firsthand the brutality of, of the civil wars in, in Scotland. But that doesn't mean that people aren't having these conversations, having these debates and having these arguments uh, across the kingdom, which they clearly are. And again, a, a good uh, insight into that is looking at things like borough records and, and church court records because that's where people are brought um, to, to account for having these disputes and we have examples things like um, uh, in Aberdeen there's a, a, a servant woman who is brought before the, the borough uh, council because she was heard publicly denouncing the covenanters as traitors and calling that they have no um, no role in the kingdom of heaven so she's brought before the the Borough Council to answer for that. And, you know, in similar kind of episodes break out across the kingdom. There's a good example from Dumbarton, uh, where a local minister, James Wood, um, preaches a sermon in 1645 where he, he preaches in favour of uh, the king's cause, the royalist cause, and then he whips up a posse from his congregation, marches down to the gates of Dumbarton Castle, and tries to convince the Covenanting garrison inside that they should. Uh, switch sides, which goes as successfully as you might think it would. <laughs> and uh, James Wood ends up getting deposed for that later on. So uh, there is, there, there's, there's obviously other ways in which people can resist. And if you're a royalist and you don't want to uh, be, you know, too forthcoming in your support for the covenanting regime, there's things like people withhold taxation, uh, they slander people in the street. There is a little bit of physical confrontation in some areas. Um, when royalists are in the area, there's there's people who actively aid them. They give them intelligence. They give them supplies. And of course, there is the, also the, you know the explicit means of support whereby people run off and join the royalist army. And the Synod of Argyll is actually a, a very um, detailed collection of, of records in this regard, where you can see groups of men are brought before the Synod Court to answer for the fact that they crossed parish lines, and it's basically groups of men who are running off to try and join the rival in armies. So there is, there's multiple ways for people to do that. And then, of course, we're in a, a period of, of print propaganda and of, you know, of written slander, if, if you like. Uh, and of course, it's not as developed as elsewhere. The, the, the print trade in Scotland is nowhere as well developed as, as England during the Civil Wars. But you do get bits and pieces of royalist print which are produced. Um, there's a number of pieces which are produced in Ireland and which are kind of find their way into Scotland. And there are, there are royalist writers and and members of the, the the learned class in Scotland, particularly royalist ministers, who do write tracts in favour of the royalist cause and they, they hand them about their friends in manuscript form. And, and you, there is a few examples of uh, particularly the Scottish Kirk trying to hunt down these these uh, little reading groups, royalist reading groups. Um, so yeah, the, there is a transfer of ideas uh, quite active in, in Scotland and there is a variety of ways to show your allegiance one way or the other. And did this exchange of ideas go further afield? Was there a larger European school of thought towards like loyalty to a monarch in the context of the Thirty Years' War that's going on at the same time? Yeah, and that this is a really interesting topic and um, 
something that I personally would like to do a bit more on. And I know that Carrie Schultz is, is, is doing quite a lot about this just now. And uh, I think she's just had her, her book green light. So that'll be really cool to see that when that comes out. But basically there is a, there's, well, there's a, there's a Scottish kind of political school of thought by this point in time. And there's also a European school of thought. And it's interesting to see the language, obviously I've looked at at the royalist side of things, but the, the language which political writers, people like William Drummond and Archibald Napier, the, the phrases they use so they they kind of find these these motifs and these little passages which are reused within the scotch context but you can also see examples of them in things like the 30 years war and even like things like the french wars of, of religion and for the royalist side of things one of the, the common examples is that royalists regularly accuse covenanters of using religion as a cloak and it's that phrase using religion as a cloak which pops up time and time again and uh, there's multiple examples of that being used in the french wars of religion as well so there's obviously a kind of a european school of thought like this is how you defend monarchy and this is how you attack uh, what they dub as you know religious extremism and another good example of that is that royalists accuse the covenanters regularly of being jesuitical basically accusing them of being protestant jesuits you know these these almost extremist kind of characters and again you see examples of that creeping up in the continent as well so there is there is clearly a kind of a political language and a political school of thought uh, present which people are dipping in and out of and you know there's there's other examples of this in the royalist ranks of them dipping into uh, jacobite and marian writings to try and show kind of cultural legitimacy of the, the, the royalist cause in comparison to the covenanters that's interesting i was just about to ask about that because i know that a lot of the covenanters drew from figures like knox who was writing against mary to justify their actions against charles could you expand a bit more on which texts royalists were drawing on from from previous generations almost like was there a royalist version of noxian tracts against mary Mm. that they could make use of so there is a bit of a a pattern within some covenanting works you know things like lex rex where it's quite clear where um covenanting writers are getting their ideas from you know things like knox and, and buchanan there from the royalist perspective there isn't any kind of forefather of you know royalist political writings that they're, they're actively dipping into like that anyway but there is clear connotations if you compare it to the works of like William Barclay and Adam Blackwood both of whom are prominent Marian writers during the reign of obviously Queen Mary but also things like um, James VI writings Basilic and Doron and, and mm. the True Law where you again you can see these kind of borrowed phrases and borrowed ideas like the seditious preacher so James VI talks a lot about the seditious preachers in both Basilic and Doron and the True Law and that's a phrase which pops up in the writings of people like Archibald Napier and William Drummond so there is a bit of there's, there's quite clearly that you know these people are aware of these writings they're aware of the writings of people like Buchanan as well and uh, John Maxwell's one of his pamphlets and I can't remember which one off the top of my head but he goes through a list of all these accusations against the Covenanters where he levels accusations that they're basically copying this anti-monarch stance which has been developed by Knox and Buchanan so he's, he's using these names against the Covenanters as well as obviously the Covenanters are using some of the ideas uh, from those people in their own work so there is obviously a, a pool which people are aware of and are actively dipping into for inspiration but there isn't so much a kind of a go-to book that the royalist writers are using during the civil wars although it's clear that they are influenced by the likes of blackwood barclay and uh, of course james the sixth himself brilliant so one final nice and simple question was there a scottish revolution <laughs> i'll get I'll, I'll get my soapbox get rid of it. <laughs> Um, yeah, this is this is uh, this is an interesting question, and I guess this is spawned from uh, a discussion which happened on Twitter, which was I was a part of, and part of this was so basically on 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 this Twitter conversation, I went on the wind up a little bit, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I suggested that there wasn't a, a Scottish Revolution, and uh, we were discussing about this before we came on air, but I think that revolution is one of these terms which the historiography in general likes to throw about because it's this kind of eye-catching sexy term and it, it, it gets attention however i think that there's there's a risk that it can mask some of the complexities and some of the the subtleties of the 1640s because i think if you were to ask the covenanters particularly in the earlier part of the period so for kind of from 
1638 to 1643, shall we say, they would not have seen themselves as revolutionary. If anything, they would have seen themselves as quite conservative because it's all about trying to get back to the true form of the Reformation. They're not, they're not trying to pull down monarchical government or anything like that. If anything, they're trying to restore this kind of quasi-mythical version of the past or the quasi-mythical interpretation of what the future should look like. So in terms of a, a revolution, I think you could argue that it, it isn't a revolution. And actually, when the, the covenanting regime does does get an opportunity to enact a revolution, that being when obviously the English parliamentarians execute Charles I in 1649. The Scottish nation as a whole balks at the idea that they would have any other system other than a Stuart on the throne and they very quickly secure uh, Charles II as King of Scots and obviously that then produces a, a, an interesting debate between Charles II and uh, the leading covenanters as to how exactly they envisage uh, Charles's rule as King of Scots moving forward. But I do accept that, that there is there is revolutionary aspects to the covenanting regime, particularly that you essentially get the removal of royal control of Scotland post-1639, essentially, and you replace it increasingly with a covenanting theocracy which is incredibly powerful. But the mechanisms of state for Scotland remain largely the same. There is no attempt to kind of rip down and, and replace the system of government with anything new. There is a bit of a moral revolution, especially, and, and John Young's written a lot about this, about the, uh, the covenanting parliaments and about how eager the covenanting parliaments are to support the Kirk and trying to enforce this moral revolution or moral discipline upon the people of Scotland. However, I think it's very interesting that if you start calling it the Covenanting Rebellion, you get a very different response from a lot of people. And, you know, you can quite easily argue that it's not a revolution and it's a rebellion. And, you know, the, there's a there's connotations with both those terms, which then impact how you interpret the civil wars. And I'm not, yeah, part of my anti-revolution stance is really just to try and get people to think about that and to wind some people up, I, I will admit. <laughs> but I think it's very interesting that if you do, if you call it the English Revolution, you tend to, uh, sorry, the, the Scottish Revolution, you, you tend to get a, a certain response, whereas you call it the, the Covenanting Rebellion, you get a different response. And whether the, the Covenanting regime is just a very successful rebellion or a very sex, <laughs> successful re revolution is uh, probably quite an interesting debate that we all should be having. That is a fantastic answer to a very controversial complex question so thank you very much for that <laughs> my pleasure <laughs> um so as we bring this this wonderful conversation to a close if listeners want to read some of your work where can they find it if you want to read some of my work you're your poor soul uh, <laughs> I, I wish you all the best um but if, if you're really uh, heart set on it you can um read uh, i've published a few articles and a few chapters there's a couple of chapters which are contributed to in chris langley's wonderful edited collection on the national covenant which has just come out by boydell and brewer um i also wrote a chapter about royalist uh, allegiance during the civil wars in uh, a book on uh, loyalty to the british monarchy which you can uh, find out about. And then I've got an article on uh, Glasgow during the Civil Wars, which has been published by um, the Journal of Northern Renaissance, which you can get free online if you want to go check that out. But of course, if anyone is interested or they, they want to talk about this in any detail, feel free to uh, reach out to me and I'm always happy to have a chat. Speaking of, I was just about to say, if, if people would like something less the length of a journal article and more the size of a tweet, you can follow Dr. Lind at A underscore J underscore Lind on Twitter. I highly recommend it like you've touched on you're very entertaining when <laughs> when you decide to poke certain bears it's it's wonderful and obviously a uh, educational experience as well not just i hope so <laughs> yes <laughs> so thank you dr lind for coming on this has been this has been really interesting and really really valuable hopefully for the listeners no my pleasure and, and do keep up the, the good work of getting people interested and getting people listening to this uh, complex period which needs far more love and attention thank you very much